So how is everyone today? Any comments on uh, any of the inner work? Any questions you may be having in terms of the inner exercises, uh, in terms of problems where it's going real well? Um, Yes, I don't, I don't know if I can word the question quite well, but there's, there are moments where I'm seeing how habitual and, I, I don't know what the word, uncontrolled my behavior is, and it, I, Kind of depressing or it's kind of I, I feel a little lost with that you okay know, that's only at certain times it's not constant other times i'm like okay this is just what it is and i'm i'm watching it but there are some times where it's i just like wow i can't seem to do anything that isn't from you know and as he is cannot do like ugh, i don't know so does that make sense as a question? Um, it, it does to a certain degree. Um, I mean, it requires energy to do inner work. And, you know, if we expend our energy on, you know, useless chatter, on excessive thinking, formatory thinking, negative emotions, identification, uh, internal considering, and various things like that, we don't have the sufficient energy that we need to do the inner work. Um, it seems like, you know, getting a bit depressed and, you know, the element of despair um, is verging towards the negative emotion end of the, the wasting of energy, the using of energy. Um, now, Negative emotions, if you go down deep into them, you will notice that underneath them, there's a, a, a me, me, me. There's the faint cry of the ego, of the subjectivizing um, faculty that, that, that uh, you know, why can't I do this? Um, are you noticing that? Um, I, can, I, I think so. I can... I, I, I can see, I can relate to what you're saying. Um, is it, uh, I mean, are you doing kind of practices in the morning, uh, trying to sort of accumulate the energy right when you wake up that can help you uh, do the work for the rest of the day? I don't do it, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't do it as often as I, I wish I did. Um, but I do, I have been trying as soon as I wake up to kind of sense my whole body breathing and kind of hold the atmosphere around it. Um, kind of keep the emanations from going out at least for, you know, five minutes or so, five, 10 minutes in the morning, something like that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I know that uh, um, uh, you and your partner run a bed and breakfast. Uh, is this a real rough time of the year in terms of bookings? And um, do you feel under acute financial pressure at all? Or um... Um, Actually, <clears throat> excuse me. Actually, I, I, it's, we're coming out of that. So okay. last month was very, very rough. Um, this month is, is actually much better. And I've got a side job that has, I've been able to work. I've been working a lot of hours, but it does at least it, it alleviates the financial pressure and it also makes me feel like I'm trying to do something in that direction. So that helps me feel less depressed in, on that front. Yeah, but um, the, the, the job, I mean, it, it involves a lot of driving. And um, do you do a lot of inner work when you're driving or are you stuck in your head brain, listening to podcasts, listening to the radio? Um, um, I mean, I'm definitely, stuck in my head brain for sure um i try and maintain like a bodily awareness so that i'm not just in my head brain um i try to be present um i do i do still struggle with the the road rage to a certain extent okay although i i am i am catching actually that's something that i've noticed i 
I'm able to kind of pull back from that more quickly. It just, it, it feels gross in, in my system now in a way that it, like, it just, oh, I'm just like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to put that out there. That doesn't feel good. So that's, that's actually a good thing, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I know that for myself personally, um, something that really, really helped facilitate my inner development is the fact that I haven't had a car since 2002. Um, I drove a taxi in England for two years, sort of, uh, you know, 1999, 2000, um, stuck in traffic and traffic lights and cars and other people. Um, it's almost like your ego um, expands to the contours of your car. And there's a degree of invisibility by oh. being in the car, which allows people to vent. Um, in a way that they probably wouldn't if they were walking down the street and interacting with people like human body to human body. Somehow the mechanical nature of driving a car, uh, at least for me, brought out a lot of negative emotions. I remember, uh, you know, before she became my wife, before she became my ex-wife, the very first time my girlfriend was with me in a car, and this was back in uh, 1980, she couldn't believe it. It was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I was this real nice person. And then I got behind the wheel of a car and I was yelling and honking and cutting in and out. And um, it was a real negative dimension of my uh, uh, personality that came out when I was in a car. And uh, I didn't quite have road rage, but uh, um, I was constantly fuming at other drivers, calling them idiots and uh, things like that. And so, you know, since 2000, <laughs> I haven't had a car. You know, I can borrow a car anytime I need one, but, you know, I drive maybe two or three times a year. And it's just wonderful not to have to get into a car and worry about any of that. So uh, I found that car, you know, driving a car was something that was, you know, pressing my buttons and uh, really wasted a lot of my energy. Um, yeah. that's, a good, that's a good point. Um, not to talk too much about this, but I, just to make a comment, the, the invisibility, like there's a, it's like a buffer. There's like a separation, yeah. like the part of me that normally feels sort of like, oh, I need to, you know, behave around these other humans. It, it, it's not as in touch. There's like a space, like I feel like I'm removed from everything. Yeah. Um, so I guess in that sense, it's a good, it's a good way for me to kind of get a handle on that part of myself. But it, but it does also waste energy, so that's good. Yeah. That's good how, how, how can you set up a reminding factor or when you're in the car? Um, I mean, do you have on your phone, on our phones, you know, we can get something called uh, the mindfulness belt. It's an app. Um, let me find it on my phone. Um, see if we can. It's a... Oops, it's a mindfulness app, and you can set it to ring. Uh, I have, you know, for the settings, um, you could, I mean, you can turn it off, say, between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. when you're sleeping, and then get it to ring randomly or regularly so that as you're moving around, you can just have it ringing in the background, um, just hopefully reminding you to come back to the moment and be present in the moment. Um, so, you know, I do suspect that a lot of your problem is the fact that, you know, you get into a car and you spend a lot of time in the car and driving around. And, you know, there's something about a car that makes us more into machines and uh, that opens us up to those lower energies than uh, um, otherwise. Um, perhaps, you know, try to do more focused uh, inner exercises when you wake up to try to accumulate the energy uh, that you need for the rest of the day um, would be a one possibility. Um, Thank you. Any other questions, comments about the inner work? Um, Antoine. Uh, I hear you speak a lot about mindfulness. 
Yeah. Uh, when I read the books of uh, Ospensky and Gurdjieff, I always heard the word, and I practiced uh, divided attention and self-remembering. Yeah. So, uh, do they uh, do they uh, use uh, this word? Uh, no, they don't. Um, the reason I use mindfulness a lot, I didn't use mindfulness until about seven years ago. Um, but mindfulness has become huge in psychotherapeutic circles. So psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers are all teaching mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness was actually on the cover of Time magazine a few years ago. They called it the mindfulness revolution. And self-remembering is a very advanced form of mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness in its pure definition is any present-centered focus of our attention done in a non-judgmental way. So to bring my awareness back to my body, back to my breath, back to the air that touches my face, uh, the clothing uh, that's touching my skin, to bring my awareness to uh, gravity, to the internal sense of balance, to the awareness of temperature. Um, these are all acts of mindfulness. And as I said, self-remembering is a very advanced form of mindfulness. We have a head brain, a body brain, and a feeling brain. And within our head brain, we can be mindful of what we see, so let's just try to do this now. Try to become mindful of all of the light and uh, all of the images coming in through your eyes. Try to do uh, what uh, um, Paul Beidler, one of Mr. Gurdjieff's students, talked about the, uh, he called it the impartial gaze. So just try to be aware of the light on the periphery, uh, the focal point in the center. Uh, become aware of the light coming in your eyes, and then try to become aware of impartial hearing. So try to be aware of my voice, any other sounds in the background. Uh, try to become aware of impartial smelling, the scent of the air, um, maybe even your own scent, your body scent. And try to become aware of the impartial tasting in your mouth. Now our eyes, ears, nose, and taste buds are all located in our head. And uh, this is externally perceiving. So this is a head-brain phenomenon. So when we are mindful of what we can see, hear, smell, taste, we are actually engaging in a form of head-brain mindfulness. Now we can also become mindful of the words in our mouth, our mouth, the words in our mind and the pictures in our mind. This is the hardest thing to become mindful of. Uh, because there's a hypnotic quality to the words and pictures in our mind, and we normally get pulled out of that present-centered focus of our attention when we focus on the words and the pictures. But we can, for instance, imagine the sound cat in our mind, and we can imagine being present now, aware of saying the sound cat in our mind, we can also imagine seeing the word cat, C-A-T, here in this present moment. But it is the biggest enemy, the internal dialogue, the formatory thinking, that once we get trapped in that, it pulls us away. So we have a head brain. We can be mindful in our head brain, consciously or mindfully looking, listening, smelling, tasting. We can also be mindful in our body brain. And within our body brain, you know, there are a number of different things we can really sense. We can become aware of the effect of gravity on our body. We can become aware of uh, uh, here and now, the sense of balance, how our head is balanced on our neck, which is balanced on our shoulders, our shoulder blades, our rib cage, balanced on our spine, balanced on our pelvic bone. Um, we can become aware of the various pressure points under our body under our uh, uh, sitting bones, under our thighs, under the bottom of our feet, where we're touching the ground. Uh, we can also become aware of internal sensations. The sensation, for instance, within our side, our esophagus, uh, the sensation within our stomach, our bladder, our colon. 
Uh, we can become aware of our lungs inflating and deflating, um, these internal sensations. Mr. Gurdjieff recommended that we avoid too, focusing too much on the internal sensations, perhaps getting a, an awareness of the inside of our body, but not focusing on a specific organ or a specific part of our body. Because when we do, we, by bringing that awareness, the power of attention, which is another name for mindfulness, bringing the power of attention, say, to our liver or our gallbladder or our pancreas or our spleen, will affect the tempo of that internal organ. And because we're like these massive clocks where a little movement and change in one area can filter out and have a change in another area, we shouldn't do it because we could lead to these internal changes within our body. Now we can also become aware of the external sensations, the air that touches our face, the hair on our head, the touch of clothing, this present centered focusing of our attention. Another name for it is mindfulness. And then we have a feeling brain and we're always feeling some kind of a feeling. Usually for most people, the feeling center is somewhat atrophied. So they're not really aware of what they're feeling. Usually it's a low level of anxiety. And if they pay attention, they may notice it in their stomach. Um, that's where a lot of people feel anxiety. Um, I notice a lot of uh, emotion. I hold it in my face. Um, so we can become mindful of what we are feeling as well. Or we can focus our attention here and now in this present moment on what we are feeling. Now, self-remembering is actually at the most basic level, any form of two-brained mindfulness. As long as one of the brains involves the sensation of self, it involves our physical body. And with our physical body, the most important thing to build up to is the awareness of our whole body from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head to be aware of our body as one organic whole. So to develop that sensation of self. And then, you know, we can be aware of what we see and aware of our body, and that's a form of self-remembering. But the more we build this up, the more complex we make it, the better it is. So we can be aware of what we see, and while remaining aware of what we see, we can become aware of what we hear. And while remaining aware of what we see and hear, we can become aware of what we smell. And while remaining aware of what we see, hear, smell, and taste, building it all up while remaining aware of the sensation of ourself, of our body as one organic whole, we are building up this muscle. And, uh, you know, we can use the term mindfulness, or we can use the term awareness, or we can use the term attention. Uh, they're all interchangeable. Another thing about this is that this is a world. 24 phenomenon. So every time we bring our awareness back into this present moment, here and now, maybe focusing on our breath or our breathing or what we can see, hear, smell, taste, we are actually transforming hydrogen 24. Um, to be aware of my hands, to sense my fingers, to sense the bones in my hand, to sense the flesh in my hands, we can actually get even more exact and say that this sensory awareness, so the sensation is fueled by law 24 of the octave of food. To become aware of the external impressions that are flowing in through my eyes, through my ears, through my nose, and through my taste buds. To become aware of what I can perceive, to be mindfully aware in this moment is 
uh, an act that requires a specific molecule of the octave of impressions, and it's Ray 24. So Do 48, Ray 24 of the octave of impressions is actually what fuels our ability to be aware and mindful of what we can see, hear, smell, taste. For our feelings, to be aware of what we are feeling here in this moment. This is, um, do re mi, this is fa 24 of the octave of air. Um, so there are these three different molecules, these three different energies, these three different forms of hydrogen 24 that fuel our mindful awareness, that fuel our present-centered focus of attention. And then, as I said, basic self-remembering is two brains, one of which must be the body brain, the sensation of self. So to be aware of what I see, or aware of what I hear, or aware of what I smell, or aware of what I taste while sensing my body is a very basic form of self-remembering. To also be aware of what I'm feeling while remaining aware of my body is a very basic form of self-remembering. But to be aware of all three is where we get into the three-brained awareness where we get into full self-remembering. Now, one of Mr. Gurdjieff's students called Willem Nyland, um, who uh, had a group uh, called the Chardovan Barn just outside of New York City, he talked about the simultaneity. And when we think about it, um, we can be aware. What can we be aware of in any given moment? There's a simultaneity of mindful perceptions. There's a simultaneity of various different things we can be aware of here and now in this moment. So I have eyes, I have ears, I have uh, um, olfactory uh, um, senses in my nose, my taste buds. I can be aware of gravity, of balance, of temperature, of atmospheric pressure. I can be aware of the internal sensations in my body, my stomach, my bladder, my colon. Uh, my throat, uh, my esophagus. I can be aware of the external perceptions or sensations of my body, the touch of clothing, the touch of air, the hair on my head, any jewelry or anything I may be wearing, um, the places where my body has been pushed down onto the seat. And then I can also be aware of my feelings. So in terms of mindful perceptions or any present-centered focus of our attention, we can be aware of one or more of these, and we can layer them and develop this simultaneity of mindful perceptions. And the more we do it, and the more complete we do it, the more we become uh, proper three-brain beings. And this mindful perception, World 24, you know, being fueled by law 24, the sensations, law 24 of the octave of food, um, ba 24 of the octave of air, the feelings, and ray 24 of the octave of impressions. When we do it in a three-brained balanced way, then we are actually right on the edge, right at the top end of being a man number four in that moment, ready to flip over into a man number five, to use the Gurdjieffian terminology. Um, so a uh, man number four is someone who has begun to try to harmonize their three brains. Um, and there are other ways that we can do this. Um, if we're intellectual and we tend to be too much in the mind to actually get into the body, to take up a craft, to try to do something with our hands that requires the moving center. If we're a very physical person, to perhaps you know get a hold of Oraj's book about mental exercises and begin to do things with our mind. Uh, if we are an emotional person, 
you know, to try to do something with our mind, with our body. We're an intellectual person to try and do something with our feelings, to develop our feeling brain. So whatever we are, you know, if we're a man number one, you know, physically oriented, man number two, emotionally oriented, man number three, intellectually oriented, by trying to develop some of our weaker functions, we are also doing that harmonization of the three brains. So there are many different ways that we can uh, tackle this. Um, so um, to answer your question, that's a very complex and detailed answer, Antoine. But uh, you know, mindfulness is just the Buddhist term. Uh, and in Buddhism, actually, the term is sati. And uh, the reason mindfulness has become so vogue in the West and in psychotherapy is a uh, practitioner of Zen Buddhism, a man by the name of John Kabat-Zinn, was at a Japanese Zen monastery studying with his master in uh, the 1970s. And he was taught mindfulness and he thought, wow, this would be great to bring into Western psychotherapy. Now, John Kabat-Zinn had a PhD in molecular biology and he became a professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, he wasn't a medical doctor, but he taught um, students in medical school, molecular biology, and he opened the first center for mindfulness-based studies at the University of Massachusetts. And he began to actually do double-blind, peer-reviewed research studies on mindfulness back in 1979, 1980. He published the first academic research that proves that mindfulness is very effective in terms of, say, for instance, helping people deal with anxiety, depression. Um, he started the ball rolling. And now every month, there are approximately 30 to 35 peer-reviewed academic research studies double-blind, properly done on mindfulness. So it has become this huge focus of interest um, within psychologists, psychiatrists, academia. It's filtering down into psychotherapeutic circles, so counselors. Um, all major hospitals offer a, an MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction program. So my using, I've adopted the term mindfulness just because a lot of people understand mindfulness. Um, I only came across the term mindfulness in 2010. And I remember when I came across it, I went, wow, I'm already an expert in this. I've been practicing advanced forms of mindfulness since 1981. I just called it self-remembering, self-sensing, self-observation, self-study. Within the Gurdjieff tradition, anything that's preceded by the word self with a dash is actually a form of mindfulness. So within the Gurdjieff teachings, we've got so many more sort of flavors and tastes of mindfulness. Um, and also within Buddhist circles, they generally teach one pointed mindfulness. I've had a lot of arguments with Buddhists who say you can't be aware of what you see, hear, smell, taste, the sensations and the feelings all at once. Um, because they're taught to become mindful of the sunset and then mindful of their breath and then mindful of the breeze and then mindful of the smell. And they're taught to move from one to the other to the other. And this is the way it's generally taught in uh, Western psychotherapy. And I tell them that, no, there's an even more advanced form and to be fully human, to be properly human, to be a man not in quotation marks, as Mr. Gurdjieff talked about it, is to try to be as mindful as we can of the various different areas that we can be mindful of at the same time, the simultaneity of mindful perceptions. A long, a long explanation. Um, uh, does that make sense to you, uh, Antoine? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering just uh, in the teaching, we call it self-remembering. I know in Buddhism, they call it mindfulness. And uh, yeah, I, I have an idea about that. Yeah. But thank you. It was uh, very clear, uh, your uh, yeah. explanation. 
Yeah. I mean, hopefully, as I was explaining it, um, you know, I'm a hypnotherapist. I know that when we start talking about things, hopefully you were becoming aware of the different things that I was describing. Um, you know, the touch of clothing, the air on your face, the hair, um, your body, uh, developing this awareness, becoming aware of what you can see, hear, smell, taste. Um, in, in, in Search of the Miraculous, Mr. Gurdjieff said to become aware of our eyes seeing doubles the impression. Basically, when we're mechanically aware of what we're seeing, that's a hydrogen 48 phenomenon. When we become mindful, when we become aware of it, we're stepping up into world 24. So in a sense, we are doubling it. It's a, it's a more, it's a, as a perception, it's twice as intelligent, twice as vibrant, twice as conscious. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff also used the term personally conscious. So to be mindful is to be personally conscious. Um, so, uh, uh, and uh, Ahmed, I noticed that you came on. You came on a while ago. So uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Antoine's in Lebanon. You're in Egypt. Uh, Ian's yes. in Portland, Oregon. Um, Karen is in Mexico. Okay. I think we lost uh, Sona. She's on a uh, ferry somewhere. And I'm here in Toronto, so we're from all around the world. Um, I have, I have a, a question. Okay. Uh, yeah, regarding uh, part of uh, Mr. Gurdjieff's uh, teachings was the, the movements. And the what? Uh, actually, I've been in the movements. I mean, the movements okay. of uh, the exercise of movements. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been part of one of the, you know, the workshops that happened here in uh, Egypt. Uh, the the teacher uh, sort of practice where we engage our bodies in a little bit of sophisticated movements and I felt uh, that uh, if you think of the movement you lose control and you fail to do it uh, you, you just have to go with the flow and leave yourself don't, don't think just just do the movement uh, and I felt that it, it's very useful being mindful in your body uh, uh, is there any any that we can practice something this, uh, or give us because it's not clear in the, in the books the the types of movements you have to have an instructor yeah um i i did the movements for a year um and this was a while ago and there were 39 movements um that were created by mr gurdjieff and not just created that he also uh, learned somewhere on his travels. Um, the movements instructor that I had, I kept on telling him that we shouldn't call them movements because in the early days, Mr. Gurdjieff referred to them as sacred temple dances. And I said, you know, sacred temple dances has a much more, um, you know, nice feel and it's more attractive uh, to people. Movement sounds very dry. Um, but the movements are really all designed to focus the attention, um, to teach us how to focus our attention. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff's major book, um, Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson, uh, if you've ever tried to read it, it seems almost incomprehensible uh, because it requires a tremendous focusing of attention, and people have called that movements of the mind. Um, so a way of harnessing our attention and bringing it into the moment. Uh, within movements, part of it is to educate the body brain, um, because they have the most experienced people at the front of the classroom, and they have the teacher at the front of the classroom, and you're actually told to imitate physically the person in front of you to watch them moving or to watch the instructor moving, to not engage the head brain, uh, to engage the body brain. But they can get even more complex than that. Um, you could have one side of the body moving in one time and another side of the body moving in another time, like, you know, three, four time in one side and four, four in the other. 
and it gets very, very complex. And um, another thing about movements, Mr. Gurdjieff said that uh, our feeling center is pretty well complete by the age of eight. Um, so, uh, and this is something that neuroscientists are talking about as well, is that our feeling center and our feelings are limited. And, you know, we, we grow our feelings until about the age of eight, and then that center becomes complete. And every feeling that we currently feel is really a refeeling of something we felt before the age of eight. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff said our feeling center is complete by the age of eight, but we can shift things around, so to speak, until around the age of 16, 17, 18. We can't add, but we can re-emphasize certain points. And then it's closed off and we are limited for the rest of our life. And one of the purposes as well of movements was to teach people how to feel new feelings. So, you know, you do feelings and you open your chest and suddenly you become aware, like, wow, this movement has opened an awareness and a feeling in me. And so a lot of the movements as well are designed to create uh, a, an awareness of feeling. So we learn them through the moving center, through imitating other people through our movements, trying to disengage from the head brain. We live too much in the head brain. So we try to get into the body brain, particularly the moving center, and we focus on the person in the line ahead of us or on the instructor in the front of the classroom. Um, and then as we learn them, as we do them, we begin to notice this other awareness, this awareness that comes through emotion that comes through feeling. I know that the year that I took movements, I thought it was really frustrating because we would focus on certain movements. One class, and we did them on Sunday afternoons, we spent three hours at a dance studio here in Toronto. We would focus on you know, a certain set of movements and then the next week it would be something completely different. And the next week it would be something completely different. And I, you know, why don't we go back to the one we were practicing? And it's all part of the technique. Um, they also talk about within movements that there is a line where you're comfortable and where you're uncomfortable. And even the best instructors have to find that line of competence and incompetence, that no one can ever fully master the movements, that you have to find that line where you feel good on one side and you feel like a hopeless idiot or some kind of an idiot on the other side. And so that uh, you don't sort of become a, a swaggering idiot and uh, think that you know it all, that uh, it, you find that level where you're just at the edge of your skills. Um, unfortunately, uh, this is, to me, this is one of the real um, big problems of the Gurdjieff teachings. Uh, in tales in the the introduction in the first chapter from the author uh mr gurdjieff ends that chapter you know how shall i sign my name you know it's a very important the signature and he said you know some people have called me the tiger of Pakistan, and um you know various other things but then he said you know he was going to sign sign it as a teacher of dance and unfortunately, this has been hidden away. Um, I know that Madame de Salzman back in the 60s had very, very elaborate recordings taken of the movements. So somewhere in the vaults in Paris, there are these incredibly elaborate recordings, video recordings or film recordings of movements but it's something that's been hidden away. I know that within a lot of Gurdjieff Foundation groups, they will not even teach anyone movements until they've been in the foundation for a year. So the number of people who are skilled in movements, able to train people in movements is very limited. 
I know that there's someone, I believe it's somewhere in Eastern Europe, who is trying to bring it more out into the open. And they've, uh, you know, publishing books on some of the movements. But, uh, um, you know, I think that for every 10 yoga studios, there should be a movement studio or, you know, a sacred temple dance studio teaching people these things. And here it's another interesting point is that Mr. Gurdjieff planted his knowledge in the head brain of someone like Uspensky and some of the other followers. So it's represented in the books that we read, the learning of the teachings. He also implanted the teachings in the over 200 musical compositions that he created with Thomas de Hartman. He would whistle a tune or play it on the harmonium or whatever, and then get Thomas de Hartman to do it on the piano. Um, so the teachings are not just embedded in the head and, you know, like in Search of the Miraculous and in our head brain, they're also embedded in all of the musical compositions that he created with uh, uh, Thomas de Hartman and they are embedded in the movements. I remember when we were taught the Enneagram movement, there was a specific part of the Enneagram movement that jarred and jived with something that I had figured out about the Enneagram with my head. And I had figured it out with my head, and there I was doing it with my body. And a, a lot of those dances, uh, the, the, the movements actually embody these teachings so unlike a normal teacher who just teaches the head brain he taught the body brain through movements and the feeling brain through the musical compositions that he created and um, for those online uh, for those on facebook watching this um, google uh, Gurdjieff de Hartman and you will find a lot of music online it's wonderful music it's very uplifting music um, it, it, you know, then there, there are songs called Holy Affirming, Holy Denying, Holy Reconciling, which, you know, the, the, the head brain, body brain, feeling brain, the highest levels of reality. Uh, uh, so the compositions embody uh, these teachings as well. Um, any other questions? Does it answer your question, Hamid? Okay. Any other comments, um, questions? Antoine. Uh, I want to, to ask you if you can talk a little bit about the three centers or four centers, and uh, if you have, uh, can you resemble them in the playing deck of cards as the jack, queen, and king, the mechanical part, the emotional part, yeah. and each center? Um, According to J.G. Bennett, in World 48, in the earthly realm, um, in the realm, you know, using, say, St. Paul's term, carnal man, or Mr. Gurdjieff's term, mechanical man, we have three brains. We have a head brain, a body brain, and a feeling brain. Now, our body brain has three parts. And at the highest is the moving center. At the lowest is the instinctual center, or not at the highest. Um, the highest is the sexual center. But the physical brain is composed of the sexual center, the moving center, and the instinctual center. This is at the level of brains. Uh, at the level of brains, you know, our emotional brain also has an intellectual part, a physical part, and an emotional part. The same with our head brain. In World 48, at the mechanical realm, we can talk about brains. Uh, J.G. Bennett then said, Mr. Gurdjieff also talked about centers. And if you look and do a search in uh, Beelzebub Tales, you can see certain terms that are used. Um, for World 48, for the brains, Mr. Gurdjieff often uses the term organic. Uh, for World 24, J.G. Bennett says that here the term is centers. So we have an intellectual center 
a physical center and an emotional center. Using the word center as different than brain. And entails, Mr. Gurdjieff uses the, he'll use the phrase willful, excuse me, psychic and organic. Organic is the organic self, the physical self, the physical body, our self and world 48, our three brains. Psychic, this goes back to St. Paul, soma is body, psyche, and then pneuma, the three different levels um, of being. So when Mr. Gurdjieff uses the word psyche, he's referring to world 48, that mindful realm, that realm of personal consciousness. So the intellectual center, the physical center, and the emotional center. According to Bennett, the word center is used to describe the manifestations of these three different aspects of ourself at that level. And then at the higher level, at the level of pneuma, so soma psyche pneuma, um, body, mind, and spirit, or body, soul, and spirit. At the level of pneuma, Mr. Gur Mr. Gurdjieff uses in Bales of Tales the term willful. So, uh, and he also talks about the three spiritualized parts. So, in the body brain, they are separate brains. There's a harmonization as we move into the three centers. But at the higher level, and this is the level of the real eye of world 24, there's spiritualized parts. So we can talk about the intellectual spiritualized part, the physical spiritualized part, and the emotional spiritualized part but they are parts of a whole and they are not distinct and separate at that level um now the other thing is in terms of uspensky um mr gurdjieff was always trying to so to speak pull the rug out from under him so as mr gurdjieff taught the system to uspensky he kept on changing things because he didn't want Uspensky to fully systematize it with his head brain, so to fossilize it with his head brain. So he would talk about, you know, four centers and then five centers and then seven centers and, you know, add these different levels, these different dimensions to uh, what is going on. But, uh, you know, we've got to realize that we have, we, we, don't just exist in the physical. We are multi-story beings. You know, there's a, we have a self in the metals, a self in the minerals. We have a vegetative self. We have a invertebrate self. We have a vertebral self. Our vertebral self that we share with animals is the mechanical realm where we can talk about world 48. And then we also have a mindful self. But the mindful self's not fully developed. It's like uh, um, it's only developed to the note of me. Uh, it's not a full octave. And part of our process in this life is to develop that self through mindful awareness, through the three brains, through the harmonization of the three brains. And then we have just an embryonic self in world 12. Uh, um, Willem Nyland said it's like it's a single cell in world 12 that we have to grow, that we have to cultivate and, you know, to, to create a, a, a new being. So we have a physical body and within our physical body, we've got the development like a 28 week old fetus of the Kesjian body. And he used the term Kesjian because he didn't like the term astral or emotional body because they, uh, there was too much other connotations associated with that word, but we've got to develop that inner body, that Kesjian body, and then within the Kesjian body, we develop the higher being body, and we do the step-by-step, process-by-process. And I guess, seeing as though I'm here talking about this, um, there's a chapter in Bales of Tales that's called um, The Proper Form and Sequence. 
So there's actually a proper form and sequence to the growth and development of our Kesjian body. And we develop our Kesjian body through the harmonization of our three brains. So if you're intellectual, to develop your emotional and physical. If you're physical, to develop your intellectual and emotional. And if you're emotional, to develop your intellectual and physical, to start balancing your brains. But everything you hear, everything that happens to you leaves a memory inside of yourself. Now, a memory is not imaginary. A memory actually exists in the biochemicals, in the structures. It's found in your mind. This is why my memories are different than your memories. I actually have physical memories going back to childhood in my mind. They, they are physically present. They are some kind of crystallization, to use Mr. Gurdjieff's term. Now, if I become mindful of my body, if I become mindful of the touch of air on my face, if I become mindful of my breath, of my breathing, the touch of clothing, I'm leaving another crystallization, another memory within myself, except rather than being a habitual and automatic world 48 type memory, it's a world 24 type memory. So every time I bring my attention to this present moment in a mindful way, any time I become aware of something here and now in this moment, I am actually leaving a higher order crystallization inside me. So every time we are engaging in some kind of mindful activity, we are creating a crystallization within ourselves. And this crystallization, if it's done in the proper form and sequence, eventually grows and becomes the Kesjian body. This is the problem with identification. Identification is the misuse of C12 by the other centers. So it's the... Um, emotional center, you know, the octave of air, stealing C12 to create emotional forms of identification, negative emotions, and there can even be positive emotions involved in emotional identification. Oh, I love that person, and oh, I love all the money I have. It doesn't have to be negative. Underneath it is the, the, the taste of the ego. And then intellectual identification, is, you know, we become identified with our nation or with an ideology or a philosophy or all these other different ways. And we're actually creating crystallizations within us around this misuse of this energy. So we are creating abnormal crystallizations within us, deformed crystallizations that ultimately we have to melt down. So we've got to get rid of our beliefs. We've got to take care of that. And then we have to crystallize the Kesjian body through the proper form and sequence. And this is in that chapter, but you have to know how to read it. Uh, the chapter on form and sequence entails. And so the first thing to focus on is the sensation of self, to develop the full and complete sensation of self so that in the click of the finger, we can become aware of our body and be aware of our whole body from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head. And we have to do this because we have to be able to hold this in second position. So that in first position will be the awareness that comes in, the receiving of impressions. This is another uh, goal of Beelzebub Tales, which is why I do not recommend, you know, people join uh, Beelzebub Tales discussion groups or whatever until they've read it, um, because you will never have a second chance to receive a first impression. And Beelzebub Tales, on 
a major level is all about receiving first impressions. Um, we rarely get the opportunity to receive a first impression about language. Language is such an automaton. Within that book, he creates 450 words, neologisms. We get the opportunity to encounter words for the first time over and over and over again. Mr. Gurdjieff said that as we age, uh, certain people are unable as they age to receive a new impression. I've noticed this with some old people. Whatever you say, it brings up a memory. You know, it's like you're pressing a button. Things are not going within them in the right proper form and sequence. And uh, page 1169 to 1173-74 in Tales explains this. He uses some misleading words, but he talks about the fact that, you know, if we're not receiving impressions properly, we don't crystallize in the proper way. So it's very important to develop the sensation itself, to do a lot of work and inner work on developing that awareness of ourself. J.G. Bennett's 60 point exercise, Mr. Gurdjieff's filling exercise. But the goal is to develop that organic awareness of our physical self and to develop it to such a degree that we can hold it in our background. So hold it in the second position. If we don't have that developed properly, and in uh, a page between 1169 and 73 in Tales, he talks about the, the sacred denying. And by that, he's meaning the body brain. So we have to be able to have that awareness in the back of our mind while we become aware of what we can see, hear, smell, taste, while we receive external impressions, while remaining aware of our body, and then something grows between them, which is our feelings. He calls them, I believe, being autokolonitzers is the neologian, neologism that he uses. So through this proper form and sequence of being mindful, of developing these brains in the proper way, every time we become aware in the proper form and sequence, we are leaving a higher order crystallization behind within ourselves and over time these will form into the Kesjian body which will allow us then to create the the higher being body inside so this is you know this is all part of an ancient ancient science uh that goes back mr gurdjieff didn't invent this um he brought it to the west he introduced it to the west but, uh, you know, it's all there. It's all in tales. It's in chapter nine of In Search of the Miraculous. It's in the teachings. It's in the, you know, the other students of his. It's, you know, you can find it in Fritz Peter's Boyhood with Gurdjieff. You can find it in, you know, Catherine Hume's book. You can find it all over. He's got little bits and pieces of this embedded throughout. And it's our job to go and kind of, reassemble them and figure out what he's talking about. Um, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? We seem to be uh, involved in questions today. Um, I, I, I should... Can we, can we do an Pardon? Can we do an exercise uh, on the body, on sensation? Sure. Um, okay, you know, it's always good to begin an exercise, and we've been doing them. As I've been talking about the sensation of clothing and air and hair and what we can see, hopefully you're becoming aware of that. Hopefully um, we are developing that awareness, um, but we can do a formal exercise. The other thing is, uh, one of the aphorisms on the study house wall was remember yourself always and everywhere. Um, the only reason to practice is because if we set aside a time in the morning or whatever, um, it forces us to do it. But we should be practicing this everywhere all the time. Um, it should become more and more and more a natural state. 
But, you know, we have a self in the world, 48. That's a physical, earthly self. Our body really belongs to the earth. It's made of the, 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 the minerals, the metals, all of the stuff in the earth. And there will be a part of our body that will, ret our body will return to the earth. We'll bury it in the grave. So whenever we do in our work, we are touching upon the body. We are touching upon the earthly self uh, within the level of essence, within the level of world 24. Mr. Gurdjieff said that we have human essence. So our essence is something that we share with humanity. And, you know, I like to visualize like a cup of water, and my essence is a drop of that water, but it's part of that water, and it will return to that water. Um, and then the real I is the part of that's myself. So I always like to affirm that I am doing this work for myself. I am doing this work for my fellow human being. And I am doing this work for the earth herself. So just think along those three lines, affirm them however you want to in your own mind. And then let's do J.G. Bennett's 60 point exercise. So I would like you to just bring your attention to the top of your head. And I would like you to breathe in. Uh, awareness, so molecules of attention, molecules of awareness, and breathe out tension. And then breathe in awareness and breathe out tension to the right side of your forehead. Breathing in awareness and breathing out tension to your right eye. The right side of your nose and face. your right ear and the finer muscles in the right side of your head. The right side of your mouth and jaw. Your right shoulder. Your right upper arm and elbow. your right lower arm and wrist, the top of your right hand, your right thumb, your right index finger, your right middle finger, your right fourth finger, your right baby finger, the palm of your right hand, Breathing in awareness and breathing out tension to the right side of your chest. To the right side of your midriff and abdomen. The right side of your upper back and right shoulder blade. your right lower back, your right hip and buttock, your right upper leg and knee, your right lower leg and ankle, the top of your right foot, your 
your right big toe. Your right second toe. Your right middle toe. Your right fourth toe. Your right baby toe. The bottom of your right foot. Now reversing this process and breathing in awareness and breathing out tension to the bottom of your left foot. Your left baby toe. Your left fourth toe. Your left middle toe. Your left second toe. Your left big toe. The top of your left foot. Your left ankle and lower leg. Your left knee and upper leg. Your left buttock and hip. The left side of your lower back. The left side of your upper back and shoulder blade. The left side of your abdomen and midriff. The left side of your chest. Breathing in awareness and breathing out tension to your left palm. Your left baby finger. Your left fourth finger. Your left middle finger. Your left index finger. Your left thumb. The top of your left hand. Your left wrist and lower arm. Your left elbow and upper arm. Your left shoulder. The left side of your jaw and mouth. The finer muscles in the left side of your head and your left ear. The 
the left side of your face and nose. Your left eye. The left side of your forehead. And returning to the top of your head. Now just allow your attention to rest. Um, this is my addition to this. Just become aware of your breathing. Become aware of breathing in and then breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. And then as you breathe out the next time, send your awareness down the right side of your body. And as you breathe in, breathe it up the left. Breathing your awareness out, down the right side, and breathing your awareness up the left side. Just circle around your body with your breath for a few breaths. And then again, allow your attention to rest. And we're going to do Mr. Gurdjieff's filling exercise. As a vessel fills with warm golden honey. Imagine filling your body with sensation, starting with your feet, filling your uh, feet with sensation, and then filling up to your ankles, filling with sensation from the bottom of your feet up through your lower legs, up to your knees. From the bottom of your feet, up through your knees, upper legs, to your hips and hands. Filling with sensation from the bottom of your feet, up to the lower part of your torso and lower arms. Up to the middle of your torso and elbow. Up to your upper back, chest, upper arms. And then filling with sensations right up to your shoulders. So sensing your whole body from the bottom of your feet to your shoulders. And then filling with sensation up your neck. And then up to the top of your head. Mr. Gurdjieff said that when it comes to sensation, we should start with the feet and move it up to the head. So try to be aware of your whole body as one organic whole, to develop the sensation of self, your awareness of your body, from the bottom of your feet, all the way up to the top of your head, sensing your entire body as one organic whole, trying to develop that sensation of self. And then allow your attention to rest, and we're going to finish with the collected state exercise. And uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that uh, this is something we should always finish in our work with. And so as the earth has an atmosphere, so too does our body have an atmosphere. And our atmosphere can be dispersed, yelling, conversations, Whatever we focus, uh, get lost in identification with, our atmosphere goes there. Our atmosphere can be dispersed, you know, to the other side of the city if we think of someone over there. And what we should do is try to collect our atmosphere, to keep it around us, a meter, perhaps meter and a half, four to six feet. Collect your atmosphere, keep it calm. Keep it still. And we disturb our atmosphere with our thoughts, with our feelings, and with our sensations. So keep your thoughts calm, your feelings calm, your sensations calm. Become aware of the border of your atmosphere, a meter, meter and a half surrounding you, like a cocoon or like a sphere, or like an atmosphere surrounding your body. And in a moment, I'm going to count from one to three. And when I get to three, breathe your atmosphere in. And then as you exhale, imagine 
retaining something of this atmosphere within you. So become aware of your atmosphere, meter and a meter and a half around you. Become aware of its border. Keep it tranquil. Keep it still. One, two, three. Breathe it in. And then as you breathe out, imagine something remains within you. And Mr. Gurdjieff said that whenever we do inner exercises or inner work after we are done, we should stay, try to stay calm and not move for at least 10 minutes to allow the emanations we created through the inner work to settle within us, to help create and crystallize our Kesjian body. And it's always good to end with an affirmation. So repeat silently or in your mind, may results from this exercise be transubstantiated within me or my being. And then just, you know, come back, try to be calm, try to remain in this collected state. Um, I've got, you know, the, the, everything that I did today, I've got, uh, and I will post a link to it, um, underneath the, the, the video, and when I post the video, if I remember, I'll post a link to it. Um, I've got a whole section of uh, Gurdjieffian exercises. Um, J.G. Bennett's 60-point exercises there. I actually have another um, form of the J.G. Bennett 60-point exercise that someone gave. I still have to record. Um, I've got Mr. Gurdjieff's um, filling exercise, the collected state exercise, various different exercises that we can do. And it's this inner work that's actually far more important than any of the teachings. The teachings are like maps, they're like signposts, they are telling us what we're doing, but it's the inner work. That's how we grow our own being. I remember years ago, I was standing in a line, and you know how we stand in lines at grocery stores, and we try to choose the ones that's moving the fastest, and then we see other lines suddenly moving very quickly, and we think we've done the wrong line, and you know, it can bring these negative emotions, and, and I was there, and I suddenly thought, hey, wait a minute, I can remember myself. I can become aware of my body. And from that moment on, lines, have never been a problem for me. You know, I trained myself that when I stand in a line at the bank or at the grocery store or wherever, I just try to bring my awareness back to my body. We can become mindful. We can become aware. We can self-remember when we're walking down the street. I actually have a meetup group. Um, it's too cold now and there's so much ice outside. It's too dangerous, but it's called Toronto Mindfulness Walks, where I actually teach people and I narrate them through the process of self-remembering as they walk. I live right near a, a, a river and a bit of a nature area. So we go down into the valley and become aware of how you land with your heel and push off with the ball and toes of your feet. Become aware of the movement of your toe joints, your ankle joints, your knee joints, your hip joints. Become aware of how your legs are like pendulums that swing around your pelvis. Become aware of how your, the bottom of your body moves one way and the top of your body moves in the opposite fashion so that your left leg and right leg or right arm move out at the same time. Become aware of the movement of your shoulders. Become aware of the sky and the sun and the wind touching your face and the smell and the taste in your mouth. And I narrate them through this um, a number of times throughout uh, the walk, which usually lasts about three hours. Um, so we don't have to limit ourselves to doing inner work at a specific time. Um, ultimately, in order to begin to wake up, we have to become as aware and as conscious as often as we can. And as I said last week, this is all related to energy. 
if you do not have the accumulated reserves of energy within yourself, you'll run out of steam. And it's no reason to beat yourself up. It's then to ask yourself, where am I leaking energy at the lower story of my being? Am I leaking it through formatory thinking, which is the associative mind and the words that whirl around in our brain? Am I losing it through negative emotions or through egocentric emotions? So even feeling really good if the ego's at the bottom of it, that's a form of emotional identification. It's a place where leaking energy. Am I leaking energy through internal considering, oh, I can't believe it's raining on me. Um, in Toronto, um, we had some very mild days uh, last week. And now you walk outside and it's sheets of ice. Um, and it's so treacherous. And I can see a lot of people. It's like they're sucking lemons as they're walking down the street. They, they, they're taking the ice on the sidewalks and everything personally, as if nature, you know, is against them. So are we, you know, through negative emotions, through identification, you know, go Leafs, go, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs, it's a hockey team. Um, you know, there are people who, when the Leafs lose, I, well, for a while, back in 2002, I worked down near where the uh, arena was. And I could tell when the Leafs lost or when they won just by the people streaming towards the subway. They get so identified with the team and they've got the sweaters and the hats and um, where are we leaking that energy? Where are we wasting that energy? And to begin to conserve that energy. Um, at any rate, um, we're just about out of time. <laughs> uh, uh, next week at this time, um, it's noon now. Um, for those of you who are uh, watching on Facebook Live, um, you know, if you have any questions, you can post them on uh, on my wall. Um, I'm not sure how this goes on Facebook Live. Uh, you could probably post them on the uh, feed or just ask the questions and I can answer them. I can even answer them uh, uh, during next week's meeting. So those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live, thank you. I hope you uh, found this interesting. And those of you who are here on the screen, people keep on blanking in and out. Um, we've lost Ahmed in Egypt. Uh, we've lost Sana in Turkey. Um, but uh, thank you for making it and being here. And uh, next week, take care. Thank you thank very you. much, Alan. Okay, bye now. <clears throat> uh,